morning, everybody. Looks like I'm up and running, huh? Okay, good. Give it a few more minutes and we'll start. I'm gonna meet my dog. Come here, kid. Morning, Mary Jo. Morning, Jerome. Scott. Catherine, hey. Hi, Lisa. Yeah, I tried to call you, Lisa. Morning, Janine. It's just really bizarre, guys. I just have to say. <laughs> Morning, Linda. Morning, Mark. Hey, Andrea. Louise. Okay, I just noticed that glow around my head from the reflection of the sunlight. <laughs> it makes me look like I got a halo. <laughs> Good morning, Vanna. Hey, Cindy. Okay, good. Call me Lisa. Okay, we'll just give it a couple more minutes and then we'll get started, okay? Actually, I'm going to walk away just for a second and turn that ding dong off on that clock, okay? Okay, I just turned it off, Rob. Oh, you, the clicking is loud? The clock ticking? Okay, I'll go through. Yep. Well, it must have been really loud when it chimed if the ticking is loud. Okay, Joe turned it off for me. Okay, anything else? Too loud or too weird, Rob? I miss all you guys. <laughs> I'm grateful for Zoom. I gotta start. I guess I'll start just and start yakking. I mean, I'm grateful in this season that we have this technology to be able to do this kind of stuff. But um, I really have to say, okay, thanks, Rob. Um, I don't like it. I just um, I appreciate it. I'm grateful for it. It would be horrible if we didn't have it. But um, I just. 
uh, I miss being together with everybody and it's getting old. Um, I do have to say just to, you know, make it light. This is the first time in I think five or six weeks that I have been dressed for church. <laughs> I got makeup on. I usually look a hot mess, but I will confess I do have socks on. Um, no shoes for you guys. So um, let's open with prayer, okay? Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, I just thank you so much, Lord, as I just said. I'm grateful that in this season, Lord, we at least have technology uh, to be able to cause us to be together and to um, pray together, Lord, um, here, have Bible studies, still con conduct church services, and to be able to connect with you in a way that if this was 50 years ago, we wouldn't be able to, Lord. So I, I just am so grateful to, for that. But Lord, I do miss gathering together with our people, Lord God, and, and I miss worship, Lord. I miss um, hugging everybody and Lord, just being able to sit down face to face and have conversations. So Lord, we just ask for your grace to continue to get us through this. Lord, I ask that you would um, just uh, stir up those gifts of God within me to speak to your people today, Lord God. I ask that you would um, anoint the word, Lord God, whether they're face to face or uh, through technology, Lord God. I ask that there would be an anointing, Lord, that we would hear and respond to your word today, Lord God, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> All right, well, let's get started. Uh, the Lord spoke to me, excuse me, <coughs> probably about a week ago, that um, I should speak about crushing. And <clears throat> I had all kinds of ideas on what I thought that should be uh, to speak about, but um, he led me kind of in a different direction. So when I was looking up different scriptures on crushing, uh, who he led me to was uh, Josiah. Now, I've read about Josiah, you know, know, know a little bit about the story, but um, I think when you hear um, accounts in scripture, and it's uh, more of a season of, of where the Lord is saying this is kind of what's going on now, it kind of takes on a new meaning for you. So I'm going to read um, in um, 2 Chronicles 34, and I'm going to be you don't have, I mean, if you want to follow with me on this one, fine, but, you know, don't feel like you have to follow through with me on the rest of the scriptures, scriptures, because I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit. Um, it says that Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars which were above them he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images he broke in pieces and he made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali and all around with axes. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder, and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now, I was reading that, and, and of course it starts right out. It says, He did was what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father, David. He did not turn to the right or to the left. And I, my first thought was, wow, isn't that something we all want to be said of us? I, when I think of you know my name being written in the book of life, I thought, wow. Wouldn't that be awesome if it says Teresa, and then after it, it says, she did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of her father David and did not turn to the right or to the left. Don't we all really want that, to be able to be said about us? <clears throat> now, when it says not turning to the right or to the left, it means complete, full participation. So that's something we really need to ask ourselves. As we go through this journey with the Lord, do we have, does he have our full participation in what he's doing? Are we completely involved and committed to the things that God is telling us to do? Now, there were two kings 
uh, that were the worst in, um, in the land. And guess who they were? It was his grandfather, who was Manasseh, and his father, Amon. And I, when, I, when I read that in studying this, I thought, wow, that's powerful. I mean, here this kid is, and he's just a kid. I think he was 16 when he really started uh, turning his heart towards the Lord. And very young, when he began to tear down the altars, his 18th year, so that would have been, um, what, he was in his early 20s. That's powerful that this young man went completely against what his in inheritance was from his grandfather and his father. I mean, that to me is a real testimony of the grace of God in somebody's life, right? Generational sin was broken. See, we all have the power and authority to be able to take a stand, to be have full participation and complete surrender to Christ to break those generational strongholds that are in our lives. It, in the grace of God, that is ours to be able to achieve to, right? So, um, there's also accounts of Josiah in 2 Kings in chapter 22 and 23. Um, it gives more details on um, parts of his life and some of the things that he did, uh, and, but it also gives less accounts in other things. So, for my purposes, because uh, Chronicles was shorter, uh, I didn't really want to spend a lot of time reading and everything, but I would really encourage you to read through 2 Kings 22 and 23 and finish reading the stories of Josiah in 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. But I'm going to be going back and forth, and hopefully I look at my notes a lot and remember to remind you um, which um, chapters and verses I'm referring to. Um, but um, in 2 Kings uh, 22... It gives the order of what happened with Josiah differently than it gives in Chronicles. And in my opinion, it's probably more likely um, that 2 Kings, it, the order is more correct. And I, I'm not a theologian. I could be 100% wrong, um, but I'm going to go with that. So in 2 Kings uh, 22, what happens is Josiah sends his scribe to the house of the Lord. Now, it, is, it, it is, um, has damages done just for lack of um, uh, care by the previous kings. So he knows there's damages done. Um, it's been neglected, and he wants um, it repaired. So he sends his scribe to find out how much uh, money is in uh, the house, how much tithe is there. And that's in uh, 22, uh, 2 Kings 22, verses 10 and 11, and then also in verse 13. Um, actually, I'm going to read that part, just those few verses. Don't have to turn with me, like I said. Um, let's see. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king. This is when he, he goes um, to the house. He sees the money. I'm sorry, I skipped the part. He um, goes to find out how much money it is. Um, uh, Josiah wants him to start repairing uh, the temple. And lo and behold, they find out that... Um, the high priest has found a book of the law. So he gives the book of the law to the scribe, which is named uh, Shaphan. So the scribe, of course, takes it to the king. And it says, Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the high priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now what happened when the king heard the words of the book, the book is capital B, the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. And then in 13 it says, Go inquire of the Lord for me, this is um, Josiah, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of the book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So we see that um, Josiah uh, tore his clothes. He was greatly grieved because uh, when he heard uh, the law and realized how far Israel was walking in the law, it, it grieved his heart. And he repented and realized that the suffering that uh, the Judah and Israel were going through was because of disobedience and idolatry. And I know at, at Lord of the Harvest, anyway, I'm not sure if people are listening from other places, but um, we've been hearing, I'm guessing, um, for close to a year now that repentance is the word of the hour. And I, I really pray that we've been doing that. Um, 
But what I want to talk about um, next is what I believe the Lord is adding to that. See, after repentance in, in the Second Kings um, text, after repentance came the destruction of the idols. And in the, in the text in Second Chronicles, it reverses that order. But like I said, I believe that the repentance came first. Because doesn't it make sense to you that um, how can idols be uh, destroyed in our own lives if we first have not repented? So we see that Josiah repented. He tore his clothes. And <clears throat> what he did um, is known as like the greatest reform in all the Old Testament was done by Josiah. He restored Israel's commitment to scriptures. And his story is one of restoring true worship. See, because basically what idolatry is, is it's worship. It's just worship misplaced. Um, as we read in 2 Chronicles, Josiah acts righteously and with great zeal against idolatry. Now let me read to you some definitions of what idolatry is. It's an image a representation of a God with a small g used as an object of worship. It is a person, person or a thing that is greatly admired, loved, or revered. And this is the one that really got me. It is the most heinous injury and affront to the true God. It injures God. I don't know about you, but I don't... I don't know that I've ever thought about um, an injury that we could inflict on God other than um, to break his heart. But it's an injury and affront to the true God. It's transferring his worship and honor to a rival. Wow. It's transferring his worship and honor to a rival. Idolatry brings physical ruin. It brings brokenness, pain, suffering, death, and judgment. That's powerful. Now let me give you some um, examples, and this of course is not a full list, of what can be idolatry in our lives. Uh, it can be your spouse or a desire for one. Uh, I'm sure there's many of us who are older who would be able to say we know people who <clears throat> were uh, so hell-bent on getting a spouse from the Lord that they um, married somebody probably who was more their will than God's will, and I have seen times where that did not end well. Um, your marriage itself, the, the um, image of your, your, what your relationship looks like to others can be an idol. Uh, your children or your grandchildren. And let's remember that one of the definitions was a person or a thing that is greatly admired, loved, or revered. And isn't that interesting that something that can be good, um, our children, our marriage, our spouses, our grandchildren, I mean, um, so much, actually everything on this list that I'm, I'm going to share, most of these things, are good things. But yet, they can take a turn for the worse and become idolatrous. Uh, your job, uh, money, uh, status, your ministry, uh, natural ways of living. And, and this is an example that I had, because I don't want to people to misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with natural ways of living. I try to eat fairly healthy. I mean, I, believe me, I'm not the best at it. Uh, vitamins or anything like that. Uh, you know, essential oils. I mean, I, I do use all those things, but there's, there's a line that you can cross in that. And let me give you an example of this. When I had cancer, I actually had somebody come up and give me um, a, a computer printed thing of a chiropractor um, in a different state that had found that had um, made vitamins that cured cancer, literally handed it to me. Now, obviously, this person had a lot more faith in vitamins than they did in uh, God, number one, and number two, medicine. And I just said, well, you know, thanks, but I'm not trusting a uh, uh, vitamin to, to destroy my cancer, but thanks anyway. Um, your time can be an idol. And, you know, this one really is an issue with me because, you know what, I, I know how precious time is. And uh, it's been great, hasn't it, been able to be home and having all this time. But, you know what, like I'm going back to work tomorrow. Joe's going back to work tomorrow. It's going to be, you know, I have to really think about it sometimes. What, um, 
am I being selfish with my time? Is this, is this me um, going against God's will and my time, what I want to do with it, um, and all that goes with that becoming an idol? Because it, it easily could. Um, your woundedness. You know, it, sometimes our woundedness can really become our idol. And we kind of live in that place and we exalt that place. And we, and like I said, these are just examples. So when you, when you listen to what I read, those definitions of what idolatry are, heinous injury and affront to the true God, you can see why Josiah was so, had such a righteous zeal to destroy these idols, right? See, a battle against idolatry frequently calls for violent means. Of course, I'm not talking about physical. And haven't we been crying out for revival? I mean, many of us uh, were able to tune in to hear Steve Fado last night um, <clears throat> and his uh, message to the lost. We've been crying out for revival. We, cry, we, we not have only been crying out, I believe God is going to do one, the likes of which I personally have never seen. I'm not saying other people haven't, but um, and we've been crying out for it in our churches, in our cities, in our country, for the whole world. But yet, we have to realize that as a church, do we really want the lost coming in to us with all our idols? And that's another thing we have to realize. These idols that I read about that jo Josiah destroyed, they were in the temple. They were in the church. They're in our lives. This isn't something that, you know, uh, Josiah went to uh, the building, you know, three miles away that was a different religion and destroyed their idols. This was in the church. That's sobering. It's very sobering. And you know what? First, First Corinthians 619 says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So within our bodies should not be idols of any sort. Christ wants a bride that is without spot or blemish, bottom line. <clears throat> so I believe that if we want to not miss what God's about to do, and, it, and you know what, that's another thing. Do you know that, that, that repentance can change the course of, of history? I mean, it's clear in the Bible that people's repentance changed the course of history. People's prayers changed the course of history. And it makes me wonder. We've been crying out for ourselves and others to repent for the last year. Now the Lord is saying, deal with our, 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 our idolatry. How much could this change the course of current events? And I'm wondering. I'm not saying, thus says the Lord, at this point. But I can't. God's after something in his church. He's after something in the world. And and I, I said this a couple times ago when I spoke. This is serious times. Serious times. And we need to consider whether our response to the Lord could change history as far as what God's going to do with this virus and everything. Because you see, um, if you read on, like I did, did, I do hope you guys do with Josiah, judgment did come to Israel. Because apparently the... Um, he calls them all to make a covenant with him to fully follow the Lord. And the people all agree. But see, it was an outward covenant. It, it wasn't an inward change. And, you know, we can make outward apologies and nothing change in our hearts. We can um, easily do that. Uh, now let me reread what um, was in Second Chronicles 34, verse 3 and 4. It says, in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars which were above them he cut down. And the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images he broke in pieces and made dust of them, scattered them in the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. And, you know, I read on that, that the graves, it was a veil. I can't remember now, and I didn't write it down for some reason. Sure. But the valley where um, things were scattered like this, the, the, you know, his dead 
uh, these <clears throat> these bones that were um, all these images and everything where it was all dumped um, was thought to be the place where um, not only that type of stuff was dumped and you know uh, pagan um, you know these bones and everything but also the place where the, the city would, would have dumped their refuse isn't that interesting that God wants the idolatry in our lives to be not only put in a grave so it's good and dead and gone but he also wants it he also is telling us it's done it's basically crap, people. <laughs> now, there are two idols. I want to talk about these two idols. Um, in Chronicles, only one is mentioned, but in the King's account, in 2 Kings, two different idols are mentioned. So I want to talk a little bit about them, and I'm trying to keep an eye on my time because I had a dream a couple nights ago. I want to make sure I, I have time to share that. Um, Asherah, Asherah, I'm not sure how to say that, uh, was one of the idols that um, he tore down. She's known as the Queen of Heaven. Um, it's, she's a female, known for her power of fertility and warfare. Baal is the other one. His, his um, name means Master, Lord, God of Storm, and Fertility. And when I realized that, when I read that and studied that, that's powerful. The two gods that are specifically men mentioned in this text are gods that reproduce and they're gods of warfare. So what that tells me is that when we have idolatry in our heart, it's reproducing something. And if that doesn't put a little bit of the fear of God in you, I'm not really sure what will. And it's warfare. So that makes me think it's ready for a fight. See, when we start dealing with these issues in our life, it's not going to be easy. It's going to have to be as Josiah was, righteously zealous to get rid of these things. Remember, idolatry is the most heinous injury and affront to the true God. It's transferring his worship and honor to a rival. It brings physical ruin. It produces, like I said in these two, Asherah and Baal, it produces brokenness pain, suffering, death, and judgment. God wants us to make dust of them. I thought that was so interesting that specifically it says that Josiah made dust of them. See, when something is broken in pieces, you can still, like, think of, uh, uh, you can still put it back together, right? I mean, puzzles, everybody's doing puzzles right now. Sometimes you can break things in pieces and still recognize what it looks like. You can crush it, but not fully, uh, like, a, okay, think of a clove of garlic. You can crush a clove of garlic, you know, you take that big uh, butcher knife and you give it a good whack and it, and it breaks it open. Now you can still look at that piece of garlic and tell it's a piece of garlic, right? So there's, there's a crushing, but when you're destroying something to the point of dust, it's unrecognizable. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants it to be so destroyed and so completely destroyed that it is unrecognizable to us. We can't ever think that it's enough. And I think sometimes um, that's kind of where we're at. We're not all that radical and all, all that um, complete sometimes in our repentance and our, and our change. And we, we change a little to get a little bit of relief, and we leave it at that. But see, what God's after, I believe, in this hour is complete. Those, those things that are not of God in our lives, he wants them to be made of dust. Uh, one of the commentaries I read that um, said that apparently there was horses that were used. Uh, I don't know what they were used for, but in the dedication, they were dedicated to like these um, gods and, and the horses were dedicated to the use and apparently even these horses were killed because anything at all that is connected with that idolatry had to be destroyed it was not there was nothing left um, there was something else that I, I was thinking you know you know how you hear some people's testimony and they're powerfully affected effective the reason why is because those things in their life that they're talking to you about are dust. 
they're so far gone and so destroyed that when somebody's talking to you about their testimony, you just can't believe it. And you're like, wow, the power of God. I don't see even a, a, a speck of dust in that person's life of what they're talking about. That's a powerful testimony. It, it is um, the type of crushing that they've allowed in their lives that display the cross. See, that type of, of testimony lifts the cross up, high and lift it up. See, when we resist the crushing of God to deal with these things in our life, we're resisting the very grace of God. And the reason why Josiah was so able to complete all this work was because he worshiped God. It's, you know, right from the beginning, it says that he, he reinstalled the worship of God, the true God. <clears throat> and there was something else I wanted to point out real quick before I get into my dream. I gotta really watch the time. Um, is, is remember that, that Ashtoreth was um, a, a warfare. She was known for her warfare. So I can bet you when he started going to destroy her, he had a fight on his hands. I don't doubt that at all. I'll bet he heard, you remember, you know, in the garden, you know, the serpent came and said, uh, did God really say that? Can you imagine the warfare that he got for doing what he did? I'm sure he heard the enemy say, oh, you better not do that. That's not God you're hearing from. I don't know where you think you're getting that from. I bet he was attacked from uh, probably people in his close circle, probably people, uh, the people of the land. I mean, this was idolatry worship. I mean, you know, okay, let's face it. Here in America, we obviously uh, worship our money. We think, you know, if, 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 you're, if you got money, you know, we worship our athletes. And what do you think would happen if all of a sudden we were in a great recession and um, we had no money? Look at what people are doing, you know, because, you know, it's so unsafe with this virus to be um, doing certain things or people are, are up in arms because they can't do the smallest, simplest little things for a few weeks. I guarantee you people were not happy with Josiah. Um, and that's another thing, too, that, that's, that I think will ha See, when you start to make changes in your life, major changes, uh, where you're not gonna, going to uh, be serving yourself and your idols anymore, the people that are around you are, are probably not going to be real happy about that. Um, a lot of times, it gets a little bit worse before it gets better. And... That's why, once again, you have to be righteously zealous to do these things. And something else that, that happened, <clears throat> like I said, I'm not going to read through all this just for time's sake, but um, at the end of all of this, when everything was broken down and everything, um, it says in verse 7, we had, when he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder and cut down all the incense altars, Throughout the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. So he returned. He was done. And guess what they did after that? They had a Passover. They had this huge, giant celebration. It says in there that um, in verse, chapter 35, verse 18 of Second Chronicles, it says, There has had never been a Passover kept in Israel like that since the days of Samuel the prophet. See, it was a celebration. They just weren't observing it. Because we all know, you know, sometimes we observe Christmas or we, you know, observe Easter. You know, but this wasn't, uh, they weren't just observing uh, the holiday because they had to. This was a celebration because the blood of the Lamb had delivered them from the bondage of their sin and idolatry. It was a celebration because there was a restoration of true worship. Isn't that awesome? Now, I want to, um, I had a dream Friday night into um, Saturday, and I want to uh, share that dream with you, with the time that I do have left, because I, I believe it ties into this. Um, I, I garden, and I don't, uh, you know, don't be impressed, believe me, it's not a huge garden, it's just this, you know, couple, I don't know, 
Joe was sitting next to me. He could tell me how big it is, but um, you know, it's it's you know, there's a few tomato plants, a few pepper plants, a couple eggplant, you know, nothing too impressive. And um, I had a dream that I went to the garden. Um, I hadn't planted it yet, which would make sense because it's kind of early in the year. But you have some seeds out there, so it's interesting that there's seeds. There's something underneath the ground. It hasn't yet sprung up, but it's there. So I went out to the garden, and um, I saw what I thought was a black stick, maybe like four or five feet long, uh, partially stuck in the dirt. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd because I did not put this stick here, and I'm the only one that comes out here and tends to this garden, so what's this stick doing here? Well, the closer I looked at it, I realized that it was a black snake, and that the head of the snake was buried under the dirt. So I decided to pull the snake out by the tail and just to give it a throw to get it out of the garden, which honestly in real life I would never do that, just to let you know. But um, when I did that, it turned on me and its mouth was wide open to bite me. Now, you know, think of a snake, it wasn't a huge snake, I don't know, it was, you know, so that's maybe that wide. But when it turned to bite me, the head was huge. It was like, it was, it was massive. And um, it, had teeth like shark's teeth. You know how um, shark's teeth have like rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of teeth? Well, that's what it was like. Very sharp. So I just threw it real quick and, you know, didn't see it anymore. I didn't think anything of it. And I turned around to walk away and I was walking towards um, a small building that had people in it. Um, I, I believe this was a church. I mean, there was no real way of knowing this, but it was church people that I know that were in there. So I'm assuming it was a church. So as I walked towards the building, um, <clears throat> the snake was sneaking up behind me, which I did not know, and he jumped up and he wrapped himself around my upper body, so, you know, like up, up here. And, you know, I couldn't move, and it was squeezing. And I could begin to feel that as, as it was um, squeezing, that it was beginning, I was beginning to have, have a hard time breathing, and I knew its, its intention was to kill me. Um, and at this point, for, for whatever reason, I just like kind of moved my arms, tried to move my arms up, and it actually worked, and it fell off. But as it fell off of me, it went racing towards that building um, to get into the building. So I began to yell at the others to, you know, quickly shut the doors and the windows so that the snake could not get inside. And he never did get into that building. But um, so I woke up that morning. I'm like, wow, that was definitely from the Lord. You know, <clears throat> kind of knew right away. Sometimes I'm not sure, but um, so I began to look to see what um, snakes uh, mean, you know, in scriptures, what they represent. And of course, we all know the account of the Garden of Eden um, that the snake, it, it, it was a deceiver and a liar. So we knew that. Um, but it, it represents evil, chaos from the underworld. And in pagan worship, get this, it represents fertility. So here we go again. Now this is three, three gods, two in the account of Josiah, one in this dream, that all represent fertility. And I think that's a real key that we need to be mindful of right now, is that the Lord is saying that our sin and idolatry is reproducing something. And we need to realize that we cannot allow that to happen. We need to be righteously zealous against the sin and idolatry in our hearts. Now, another thing that was interesting was in this dream, I didn't know it was a snake. So it disguised itself as something that it wasn't. And I think it's important for us to realize that we are deceived when it comes to our own sin often. We're deceived when it comes to our own idolatry. We see it as a, snick, a stick, and it really is a snake. So that makes it all the more all the more reason if someone that we're accountable to, somebody in leadership, our spouse, uh, points out something to us in our life, we need to make sure that we consider it and listen. Because what could happen is we could pull it out and that's when we know for sure. Just like that snake. See, I didn't know for sure how bad it was until I pulled it out. You want to know how bad your junk is? Pull it out and take a look at it. And then you're going to be like, 
Oh my God. Right? Haven't we all done that? I wish you guys were here. This is so weird talking to myself. I'm like preaching to myself. Um, okay, wait, I had notes on. Okay, so. Um, also, the, like the snake, <clears throat> excuse me, idolatry wants to choke the life of God out of his people. I think one of the things um, that was significant about the fact that it, it wrapped itself around me, it wanted to tie my arms down so the work of the Lord wasn't getting done. I couldn't uh, move my hands. I couldn't move my arms. Uh, there's a scripture that says, I train your hands for your hands for battle and your fingers for war or something. I might be misquoting that, but um, our hands and our fingers even are, are productive in warfare for the kingdom. Of course, our arms are. <clears throat> Idolatry wants to attack you so that you leave it hidden and don't get it out of your life. Idolatry wants to enter the church of God. Sorry, I knew that was getting to so. Idolatry wants to enter the house of God and be fertile. Joe's getting. See, that to me is the most grievous thing. Because you know what? It's one thing when it's us. But when it starts affecting other people and his house, that's a representative of if we're going to have this great revival, and I really believe we're going to have it, what do we want the house of God to look like? What do we really want it to look like? Do we want people to be able to come in from the streets? I mean, let's face it. We can't see that snake. We think it's a stick. Everybody else is looking at it and knows it's a snake, right? Right? Do we really want the lost coming into the house of God? and seeing snakes in our garden? Or do we want him to see Jesus? And you know what? Idolatry wants a fight. It doesn't want to leave. If it does leave, it's going to fight to get back in. The sin in our life is deadly. Let me reread that. Idolatry is the most heinous injury and affront to the true God. It's transferring his worship and honor to a rival. Idolatry brings physical ruin, brokenness, pain, suffering, death, and judgment. I would really want to encourage all of us to really be seeking the Lord to ask him, what are those things? Remember, one of the definitions was give me a second. A person or thing that is greatly admired, loved, or revered. It can be something very um, unobvious. It could be something, um, like I said before, children, husbands, spouses, um, good things. Good things can do a flip and turn into idolatry. I would really want to encourage, and I really hope, as we've been spending this last year repenting, that we go deeper now with that and look to see what it is that we're holding on so tight to that is is so ingrained in us that we still haven't dealt with it. And ask the Lord to help us and to be merciful to us. Because he is and he will be. And he's faithful in that and we know that. And I just want to wrap it up here with what, what it says at the end about Josiah. And I'm going to end the way I started. In 2 Kings 23, 25 it says, Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. Now when I started, I said, wow, don't we all want that to be said of us? 
what's said of, of Josiah. Well, I'm going to end it with the same thing. Don't we all want this to be said of us? Before Teresa, there was no one like her who turned to the Lord with all her heart, with all her soul, and with all her might, according to the law of Moses, nor did any arise after like her. Well, I highly doubt that's going to be the case. But, I mean, really think about that. Isn't this something we should be striving for? I don't know about you guys, but I want this next to my name also in the book of old. So, I don't care what idols God shows you. I don't care what sin he shows you. I know he's going to. He might have already. I don't know. But I, I really believe this is the word of the Lord. And I know he's going to be doing something here. Remember, that's not the end of the story, what he's showing you. The end of the story is before there was nobody like you. You can change all that idolatry and everything into this. I see Shay's name here. I'm trying not to look at all this stuff. Shay. Before you, there was nobody like you. you. If you turn to the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, Shay, according to the law of Moses, doesn't matter what, what God shows you, how, how it breaks your heart because, because you've, you've hurt him so much. It's all done and gone under the blood of Jesus, and that's wonderful. So I just want to end with prayer. we got five minutes left, but I'm just going to pray and... and um, so I don't forget, make sure you listen to uh, Communion and the Word at 11 o'clock on um, Facebook, and I think it's on the website, the Lord of the Harvest website too. Don't quote me on that. I'm not really sure. So let's just pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, I thank you so much, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you are the Lion and the Lamb. Lord God, I thank you that no matter how um, black our hearts are, Lord God, no matter how we have bent the knee to idolatry. Lord, it could have been on 57. It could have been for all my 57 years. Lord, you can change all that in an instant, Lord God. And Lord God, I'm asking that you would um, open the eyes of your people, Lord God, that we would see those things that are idolatry, idolatrous in our lives, that they're not just sticks, Lord God, but they are idols, Lord God that want to destroy and want to reproduce uh, sin and destruction, not only in us, but in others, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that we would hear you speak to us. And Lord, I pray that there would be grace, Lord God, poured out upon us, Lord God, that we can change. Lord, we want a second touch of repentance, Lord God. Lord, I'm reminded of that, the man, Lord, that was blind, that you touched his eyes and, and he could see, but um, he saw people walking around like trees, Lord God. And and Lord, if you were blind all your life, you would think that was great to be able to see people walking around like trees because at least you could see something. But Lord, that's not enough. That's not complete. Lord God, I'm asking, Lord God, that you would give us a second touch of your Holy Spirit that would bring about greater repentance, Lord God, and, and that we would have the ability to, to destroy our idols, Lord, and, and make them into dust, Lord God, so that it only takes just a gentle breeze and they blow away. They're unrecognizable, Lord God. And may it be for the testimony of Jesus, Lord God, and, and, and true worship restored to your church, Lord, not just in Michigan, Lord, not just in our country, but in the entire world, Lord God. And I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. Miss y'all. Bye.